eight years after the Prophet Joseph Smith died, two important new teachings, supported by two previously unpublished revelations, were publicly announced by the Church. The first teaching was that plural marriage was not only acceptable to God, but preferable to monogamy, and that if members didn't practice polygamy, they'd be damned. The second, related teaching, was that through sealing keys delivered by Elijah to the church in the Kirtland Temple, Brigham Young was the only man on earth authorized to allow people to practice polygamy. We know those two revelations today as Doctrine and Covenants sections 110 and 132. This video focuses on the visit of Elijah in section 110. DNC 110 teaches that Joseph Smith and Oliver Cowdery received a visit from Elijah in the Kirtland Temple in 1836, eight years before Joseph's death, in which Elijah delivered to the church the sealing keys that make possible the continuance of earthly relationships beyond death. Section 110 explains that Elijah said, quote, Behold, the time has fully come, which was spoken of by the mouth of Malachi, testifying that he, Elijah, should be sent before the great and dreadful day of the Lord come, to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the children to the fathers, lest the whole earth be smitten with a curse. Therefore, the keys of this dispensation are committed into your hands, and by this ye may know that the great and dreadful day of the Lord is near, even at the doors. The first time Section 110 was introduced to the Church was in a talk, given in 1852, in which the practice of plural marriage was announced publicly. It was given by Elder Orson Pratt in the Tabernacle in Salt Lake City. In it, he said, quote, It is quite unexpected to me, brethren and sisters, to be called upon to address you this forenoon, and still more so to address you upon the principle which has been named, namely, a plurality of wives. It is rather new ground for me, that is, I have not been in the habit of publicly speaking about this subject, and it is rather new ground to the inhabitants of the United States, and not only to them, but to a portion of the inhabitants of Europe, a portion of them have not been in the habit of preaching a doctrine of this description. Consequently, we shall have to break up new ground. It is well known, however, to the congregation before me, that the Latter-day Saints have embraced the doctrine of a plurality of wives as a part of their religious faith. Later on in the talk, Elder Pratt continued, quote, So in these days let me announce to this congregation that there is but one man in all the world at the same time who can hold the keys of this matter. But one man has power to turn the key to inquire of the Lord and to say whether I or these my brethren or any of the rest of this congregation or the saints upon the face of the whole earth may have this blessing of Abraham conferred upon them. He holds the keys of these matters now, the same as Nathan in his day. But, says one, how have you obtained this information? By new revelation. When was it given, and to whom? It was given to our prophet, seer, and revelator, Joseph Smith, on the 12th day of July, 1843, only about 11 months before he was martyred for the testimony of Jesus. Here, Elder Pratt's referring to the revelation that we now know as section 132, which didn't make it into the Doctrine and Covenants until 1876. Continuing with the quote, he held the keys of these matters. He had the right to inquire of the Lord, and the Lord has set bounds and restrictions to these things. He has told us in that revelation that only one man can hold these keys upon the earth at the same time, and they belong to that man who stands at the head to preside over all the affairs of the church and kingdom of God in the last days. They are the sealing keys of power, or in other words, of Elijah, having been committed and restored to the earth by Elijah the prophet, who held many keys, among which were the keys of sealing, to bind the hearts of the fathers to the children, and the children to the fathers, together with all the other sealing keys and powers pertaining to the last dispensation. They were committed by that angel who had ministered in the Kirtland temple and spoken to Joseph the prophet at the time of the endowments in that house. This refers to what we now know as section 110, which also didn't make it into the DNC until 1876. To finish the quote, Now let us inquire, what will become of those individuals who have this law taught unto them in plainness, if they reject it? A voice in the stand, they will be damned. I will tell you, they will be damned, saith the Lord God Almighty, in the revelation he has given. In this context, the revelation on Elijah was important because it was the source of the sealing power that allowed Brigham to seal and authorize plural marriages. It's interesting that although the introduction to section 110 claims that it was received in 1836, eight years before Joseph died, this revelation was never announced during Joseph Smith's lifetime. In fact, Joseph never mentioned a visit from Elijah in the Kirtland Temple in any of his public speeches or publications. 
This is an absolutely crucial point to consider. After April of 1836, Joseph spoke many times publicly about the anticipated return of Elijah as a future event. Oliver Cowdery, who in 1836 was the assistant president of the church, also never mentioned a visit from Elijah in the Kirtland Temple in any of his public speeches or publications. The first time members of the church heard about Elijah visiting the Kirtland Temple was in 1852 in the talk we just reviewed in which plural marriage was announced publicly. That talk was given eight years after Joseph's death and two years after Oliver had passed away. Neither Joseph nor Oliver were alive to confirm or deny this new account. This event that neither of them ever mentioned, that would have been the fulfillment of long-anticipated prophecy, was announced publicly for the first time to justify the practice of plural marriage. We need to consider the evidence that this revelation, or a portion of it, may have been forged to bolster Brigham's claim to have authority to engage in plural marriage. Important evidence indicates that Elijah did not deliver sealing keys in the Kirtland Temple in 1836. Remember this date, 1836. It's important because of what Joseph would teach publicly after this alleged visit from Elijah. In 1840, four years after the reported visit from Elijah, Joseph taught, quote, Elijah was the last prophet that held the keys of the priesthood and who will, before the last dispensation, restore the authority and deliver the keys of the priesthood in order that all the ordinances may be attended to in righteousness. It is true that the Savior had authority and power to bestow this blessing, but the sons of Levi were too prejudiced. And I will send Elijah the prophet before the great and terrible day of the Lord, etc., etc. Why send Elijah? Because he holds the keys of authority to administer in all the ordinances of the priesthood, and without the authority as given, the ordinances could not be administered in righteousness. The next year, in 1841, Joseph taught, the dispensation of the fullness of times will bring to light the things that have been revealed in all former dispensations, also other things that have not been before revealed. He shall send Elijah the prophet and restore all things in Christ. Two years later, in 1843, Joseph taught, The world is reserved unto burning in the last days. He shall send Elijah the prophet, and he shall reveal the covenants of the fathers in relation to the children, and the covenants of the children in relation to the fathers. In 1843, Joseph taught, How shall God come to the rescue of this generation? He will send Elijah the prophet. The law revealed to Moses in Horeb never was revealed to the children of Israel as a nation. Elijah shall reveal the covenants to seal the hearts of the father to the children and the children to the fathers. And in 1844, about five months before his death, he taught, What shall I talk about today? I know what Brother Cahoon wants me to speak about. He wants me to speak about the coming of Elijah in the last days. I can see it in his eye. I will speak upon that subject then. The Bible says, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord, and he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children and the heart of the children to the fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. Now, the word turn here should be translated bind or seal, but what is the object of this important mission or how is it to be fulfilled? The keys are to be delivered, the spirit of Elijah is to come, the gospel to be established, and the saints of God gathered, Zion built up, and the saints to come up as saviors on Mount Zion. In Joseph's publicly recorded talks and teachings delivered after the claimed visit in the Kirtland Temple, the visit from Elijah was still an anticipated future event. For reference, DHC is the Documentary History of the Church, published by the Church in 1902. This researcher found the same thing that I did, that neither Joseph nor Oliver ever mentioned a visit from Elijah in any of their public teachings or publications. Quote, the vision was recorded, but as of yet, there is no evidence that the vision was publicly taught by Joseph Smith nor by Oliver Cowdery. And no source yet found shows that Joseph Smith taught in a public setting that the 1836 vision occurred. Another instance of Joseph addressing Elijah's return after the reported 1836 experience in the Kirtland Temple was Doctrine and Covenants section 128, which Joseph wrote in 1842. In verse 17, Joseph quotes two verses from the book of Malachi. Quote, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord, and he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children, and the heart of the children to their fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. Verse 18, I might have rendered a plainer translation to this, but it is sufficiently plain to suit my purpose as it stands. It is sufficient to know, in this case, that the earth will be smitten with a curse unless there is a welding link of some kind or other between the fathers and the children upon some subject or other, and behold, what is that subject? It is the baptism for the dead. 
Joseph mentions the important link between Elijah and baptism for the dead, but doesn't mention any previous visit from Elijah. What's particularly interesting about this mention of the importance of Elijah without any mention of a previous visit from him is what comes in the next few verses. Joseph proceeds to make a list of the different heavenly messengers that have appeared at different points as part of the restoration. He mentions Moroni, Michael or Adam, Peter, James, and John, the voice of Heavenly Father, Gabriel, Raphael, and diverse angels, with no mention of Elijah. Certainly Elijah whose anticipated role was important enough to have been mentioned in the verses just prior to these, would have been important enough and even expected to be mentioned in the list of those heavenly messengers who had previously appeared to play a role in the restoration. But he's conspicuously absent from the list. Reading from verse 19, quote, Now what do we hear in the gospel which we have received? A voice of gladness, a voice of mercy from heaven, and a voice of truth out of the earth. Glad tidings for the dead, a voice of gladness for the living and the dead, glad tidings of great joy. How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of those that bring glad tidings of good things, and that say unto Zion, Behold, thy God reigneth. As the dews of Carmel, so shall the knowledge of God descend upon them. Verse 20, and again, what do we hear? Glad tidings from Cumorah, Moroni, an angel from heaven, declaring the fulfillment of the prophets, the book to be revealed, a voice of the Lord in the wilderness of Fayette, Seneca County, declaring the three witnesses to bear record of the book, the voice of Michael on the banks of the Susquehanna, detecting the devil when he appeared as an angel of light, the voice of Peter, James, and John in the wilderness between Harmony, Susquehanna County, and Colville, Broome County, on the Susquehanna River declaring themselves as possessing the keys of the kingdom and of the dispensation of the fullness of times. And verse 21, And again the voice of God in the chamber of Old Father Whitmer in Fayette, Seneca County, and at sundry times and in diverse places through all the travels and tribulations of this Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And the voice of Michael the archangel, the voice of Gabriel and of Raphael and of diverse angels from Michael or Adam down to the present time, all declaring their dispensation, their rights, their keys, their honors, their majesty and glory, and the power of their priesthood, giving line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little and there a little, giving us consolation by holding forth that which is to come, confirming our hope. Once again, no mention of Elijah or Moses or Elias, who, according to section 110, were all supposed to have appeared to Joseph and Oliver in the Kirtland Temple. In January of 1849, over 14 years after the reported return of Elijah in the Kirtland Temple, Oliver Cowdery wrote a letter to Elder Samuel W. Richards in the form of a testimony in which he documents the heavenly visitors, particularly those that delivered keys to the earth as part of the restoration. He mentions a list similar to Joseph's list in DNC 128, which we just read, including Moroni, who showed Oliver the plates of the Book of Mormon, John the Baptist, who conferred the Aaronic Priesthood on Joseph and Oliver, and Peter, James, and John. But Oliver did not mention Elijah. Quote, While darkness covered the earth and gross darkness the people, long after the authority to administer in holy things had been taken away, the Lord opened the heavens and sent forth his word for the salvation of Israel. In fulfillment of the sacred scripture, the everlasting gospel is proclaimed by the mighty angel Moroni, who, clothed with the authority of his mission, gave glory to God in the highest. This gospel is the stone taken from the mountain without hands. John the Baptist, holding the keys of the Aaronic priesthood, Peter, James, and John, holding the keys of the Melchizedek priesthood, have also ministered for those who shall be heirs of salvation, and with these administrations ordain men to the same priesthoods. These priesthoods, with their authority, are now and must continue to be in the body of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Blessed is the elder who has received the same, and thrice blessed and holy is he who shall endure to the end. Accept assurances, dear brother, of the unfeigned prayer of him who, in connection with Joseph the seer, was blessed with the above ministrations, and who earnestly and devoutly hopes to meet you in the celestial kingdom, Oliver Cowdery. Also noteworthy is that Oliver Cowdery's 1836 diary, referred to as his Kirtland sketchbook, written contemporaneously with these events, concludes the day before the Elijah appearance, with no mention of the event, even though there were available blank pages left after the last entry. Which of these two scenarios do you think is more likely? That Joseph and Oliver received visits from Moses, Elias, and Elijah in the Kirtland Temple in 1836, in which they received important priesthood keys, but which they never once mentioned publicly to anyone afterwards, while publicly teaching, after 1836, that Elijah's return was a future event, or that Brigham made alterations to the historical record to support a narrative that gave him the right to control the sealing power. Joseph and Brigham tell two very different stories about Elijah and his role in the last days. 
Based on Joseph's words, Elijah did not appear in the Kirtland Temple, and the church's traditional narrative about the origin of the sealing power is problematic. If we believe the teachings of our founder, Joseph Smith, we would continue to look forward to the future return of Elijah. The story that Elijah delivered the sealing keys to Joseph and Oliver seems to have been invented to bolster Brigham's claim that he had the authority to practice plural marriage. This appears to be another example in a growing collection of evidence that Brigham Young may have altered the historical record to legitimize polygamy.